Hello everyone, today we are here at the Flugwerft Schleißheim of the Deutsche Museum and we have here a message from 262 and of course a 109. And I will talk now a bit about the main differences between these two airplanes and how it's not just simple to go from the piston engine to the jet engine in a matter of months or even years. So first off, the important part, the piston engine is well established. In the First World War, all planes run with piston engines. So there's decades of experience in both military aviation, in civilian aviation, in engineering, maintaining logistics and everything around. So it's well-known technology. In contrast with the jet engine, there were turbines before the, the Second World War that were used, but usually not in vehicles or only in prototypes. So no serial production for planes, for instance. So basically, in the Second World War, during wartime, you produce a completely new engine and you make it operational in a jet fighter or an interceptor. So there's already the main difference. So you, don't, you have, don't have a gradual improvement on the technology and some tinkering. You basically start almost from scratch because you don't have prior experience on the logistical side, on the maintenance side and many other aspects. Then another aspect is, of course, heat-resistant materials. So we need a lot of noble metals and special alloys for the 262 engine because, well, it must be more heat-resistant and so you have a stronger focus on this. And again, Germany was mainly short on resources, especially in the late war. So yeah, you have this, this major problem. Additionally, since the te technology is not that evolved yet, the engines are also way, way more sensitive in various aspects. For instance, the 109, you could more or less use a, a regular airfield, a dirt field to a certain degree. But the 262, not so much anymore. For taking off and landing and also for, for the intake for the engine, you had to be way more careful what gets in there and everything. Additionally, the, the time the engine is capable of running until you need to replace it is way shorter again. So there's a lot of differences here. Another aspect with, with sensitivity is you know a piston engine very well. There are various errors and margins you, you know about. For the, for the jet engine, experience is very limited. And another aspect of sensitivity here is that for the throttle of the 262, you had to be very careful, else the engine could burn out. So this is especially a problem in combat situations. So because you can't just like, okay, there's a bandit on my six, okay, you throttle up. No, you need to be very careful and slowly. So any, any reactions or even your experience you had with a previous fighter and where your muscle memory would react could have dire consequences because if your engine burns out, you might get it running again, but yeah, it's quite problematic. Another aspect is, since these two major engines are, the center of gravity is a complete different one from for the 109. So this is, so, so the aerodynamics and everything are, are different and influence this, this problem as well. So in terms of tactics and combat experience and everything, you need to adapt your previous experience or you need to develop new aspects on how to fly it and how to best use it. Then also for mechanics, you can't just take a piston engine mechanic and give him a crash course for five hours and then, okay, let, let's do the jet engine. So there are various differences which need to, need to be taken into account because many people think, okay, oh, Germany has jet engines now or jet planes. Yeah, produce them and, and just replace the old piston engines. There's, of course, another major problem on the production side. If you switch production, there was a lot of efficiency going on for the 109. It was streamlined basically with every, with every new variant. There was a bit of streamlining done. So you could produce them in way faster quantities at the end of the war than in the beginning of the war. With the 262, basically, if you switch to the 262 from the 109 production, you need to train all the workers, you need to adapt the meshing tools, and, and you change a lot. So you use several weeks or even months. So it's also not, and in this time, you don't produce anything. So you don't have any spare parts or you don't have any replacement aircraft for the front line. So it's also not just, okay, yeah, let's switch and everything will be fine. So as so often, if one looks at the detail, at the logistics and at the problems, 
one realizes, okay, the switch is not so easy, even if you don't, if you look past major engineering problems and, and alloys and other problems. Hello everyone, it's Bismarck from Military Aviation History and yes, what a drastic shift of scene. Just a second ago you were in a museum, now you are suddenly in my studio. Also, this should be final proof that Bernhard and I are not the same person. He actually approached me asking if I wanted to contribute a bit to his video, to give you a few more insights into what it meant for the Luftwaffe to shift over to the 262 during wartime. Overall, Bernhard has covered some of the main points. But I want to expand things a bit in the time he has given me, which mainly leads into the Luftwaffe's late effort when it came to the 262. The aircraft had a few advantages over the standard piston engine fighter of the time, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Those discussions are, well, usually limited to the tactical level. Oh, how fast it was and advanced a machine it is and look at that firepower and stability in flight. But if we want to expand our scope, what does the ME262 look on the operational and then on the strategic level? Putting ourselves in the shoes of the Luftwaffe, we'll see that the aircraft has another advantage over its speed. Really, if you want to understand the plane, you will have to understand the implication of its engines, because without the engine, the plane is absolutely nothing. On the 262, it could run on low-grade fuel, which was less production intensive and more readily available. This is good because it also consumed about four times as much fuel per kilometer in relation to the piston engine aircraft. At the end of the war, actually, 262s were still pulled to the airstrip by vehicles in order to save on fuel. Yet, had they required the use of standard aviation fuel, then it would have been absolutely impossible to build up a jet fleet. That being said, the ME262 was now drawing fuel from stores that had previously gone to other units, such as you know, the transportation logistical units. So the fuel problem was, well, it wasn't overcome and it was simply shifted. Placing the engine below the wing was also giving them easier access to the actual power unit. And this is obviously an advantage. In fact, changing the engine on a 262 could be done within, well, say an hour, maybe two hours, while typically the Luftwaffe would be laboring away for about a day, maybe two days, in changing the engine on a, say, B-109, a Focke-Wolf 190, or you know, any other aircraft they have. On the 262, it was quicker to demount an engine, put in a new one, and then start repairing the old power plant. Well, if you could be bothered. Indeed, the production of a Jumo engine, the engine that the 262 actually used, was surprisingly high. In a six-month run in 1944, as many Jumos were produced as Merlins, the Royal Royce Merlin, of course, a famous piston engine from the Second World War, in the UK under one of the new Ford plants in a two-year run. And while, yes, we have to talk about unskilled labor, and yes, this was a big problem, the practical impact on production numbers was less than for piston engines. This might sound somewhat strange after all, but if you consider that around 6,000 Jumos were built, the amount of power you got out of those man hours compared with the engine is actually quite substantial. And actually, if you look at this in another aspect, uh, for, take for example the Focke Wolf 190A1 in 1941, there was a chronic lack of BMW radio piston engines, which greatly diminished their impact on the plane's introduction at the time. So when it comes to the jet engine and the Jumo production, the German Luftwaffe for once had no problems when it came to the volume of production and the numbers it could theoretically field. Engines that were faulty could, in theory, be replaced. Identifying a faulty engine, however, was another matter. Although it used more readily available fuel, that fuel still had to be scrounged from different units, and Germany really didn't have the resources for any consistent test runs. Which, of course, then means that the first usual, well, usually the first telltale sign of a faulty engine was that it would just, well, give up on the pilot mid-operation, which is kind of suboptimal if you think about it. 
But while Germany had the engines on paper, at the same time it wasn't rare for the fighter units to complain about a lack of spare parts or not having enough replacements. The logistical and communication breakdown effectively sabotaged the number game. But while the engine was available, the airframe was not designed for mass production. When it was designed, and this is in the earlier 40s and even in the 30s, the idea of quality over quantity was still very much prominent. And while the engine production numbers show a clear shift from this, after all 6,000 were produced, the airframe was the problem. You might look at the ME262 as an aircraft, it's magnificent after all, and think that the engines, because they are so new and so complex, after all this is a jet now, not a piston engine aircraft, uh, would be the biggest drain in time. But it wasn't. In fact, the airframe was. About 1,400 airframes were built, which would give us about four engines per machine. Two built in, of course, and two as spares. And, you know, on paper, in 1944, 1945, that is actually quite an acceptable ratio considering the situation for Germany. After all, everybody always talks about Germany not being able to produce enough material. But for the Luftwaffe at the end of the conflict, and in fact in the months ending up to the, uh, leading up to the end of the conflict, this wasn't exactly true. Theoretically, it did have the planes. And theoretically, it did have the pilots, just, well, maybe many hardly qualified as such. But what the decentralization of production and the logistical havoc had produced was a situation in which those two numbers, which were theoretical numbers after all, couldn't be put to practical effect. And this is really the crux of the matter. The argument that if only Germany had produced more ME262s, <laughs> falls flat on its face when you consider that it already had a good production run of both the engines and theoretically the airframes. Uh, it's just that it couldn't complete the planes they had on paper. After all, from the 6,000 engines that it produced, of the 1,400 airframes that it has, only 400 to 500 262 actually became operational. And that's not even going into the discussion on whether the Luftwaffe actually had the resources to fly them. If we just talk about completed airframes that were still over to the units, that's the number we arrive at. But if we assume that it did have the resources to fly, then it would have gone against odds that were so gargantuan and that would have greatly diminished their impact, even if more planes had been put into the sky. Germany had gone through great efforts to ramp up production and this did pay off, but in a numbers game, when you can only put about 30% of what you produce to good effect, then maybe the problem doesn't lie in the volume of production, but in fact somewhere completely different. So going back then to the decentralization of production, this was one of the biggest, really one of the biggest handicaps to overcome. And certain measures were put in place to allow the Luftwaffe to keep itself into the fight. Germany had in fact developed a decentralized production highway. It really was a highway in many ways. Situations around and sometimes right next to an actual autobahn. The one going from Stuttgart to Munich. Um, that's in the south of Germany. Stuttgart being the capital of Baden-Württemberg and Munich of Bavaria. Uh, small and big workshops produced the parts required for an ME262 that were then only to be completed in one location. This was actually usually done really, really close to the actual fighter units. And this was done more or less like a Lego kit. But while the system was relatively safe from Allied bombing, uh, since no one really could tell where these workshops were and they were designed to often shift location, picking up the parts from all these workshops was a huge logistical undertaking. Uh, nevertheless, like I said, around 500 airframes were uh, completed, but about that same number was also destroyed in Allied bombings. And a single missing part, such as a rudder, could severely handicap final assembly, with some of the workshops um, having severe problems in maintaining their production. And many of these factors that actually negatively influenced uh, production are things that we don't think about. For example, a plant situated in the Autobahn tunnel near uh, Lechfeld 
produce the wings of the TwisX2. And this is, of course, a critical component, as you be, might be inclined to agree. But it was, in fact, subject to an electricity blackout about once a week to save resources. And that completely imp you know, negatively impacts production, absolutely. And it was only by March 1945 that Germany had decided to ditch p piston engine fighters and solely focus on jets. Now, if you actually look at the reason why, it makes sense, of course, production-wise and also resources-wise. But now uh, the protected and the decentral, uh, sorry, the centralized industrial complex that were in the works to be built, protected on, uh, you know, protected on a huge uh, concrete crust, uh, were still not completed. Had they been, then maybe they could have nullified the production problems with the previous decentralization. But when it really comes down to it, that wouldn't have changed the problem of Allied aerial supremacy, their bombing, uh, the logistical nightmare of finding fuel, and the lack of you know, trained pilots, and the actual operational numbers the Luftwaffe could field at any point in time. But for now, I think that is it and should give you a bit more to run with. This is, of course, a massive topic and we could talk about all the little details in the future again in more depth. And I'll probably make a video about it at some point. But for me, that is it. So as always, I hope you have a great day. Good hunting. and See you in the sky. Big thank you here to the Deutsche Museum and the Flugwerft Schleisheim for making this video. Thank you for watching and see you next time.